Hey, Julian, welcome to the Let's Talk Melbourne podcast. I am so excited to have you on the podcast and I've been following your work and I've also read some of the criticism that you've written and I, I'm a fan. So congratulations. I think that's fantastic. And I'm so excited to have you on the pod. Thanks for having me on. I really appreciate the invite. You're more than welcome. Now, can I request you to introduce yourself for people who may not be familiar with the work you do, if that's okay? Sure. Sure, no worries. Uh, well, I'm Julian Wright. I was a journalist for about ooh, maybe 14 years, I think it was, before I um, went into the comms side of things, comms and marketing. Uh, so when I was a journalist, I wrote film reviews. That was part of my round, um, entertainment interviews, stuff like that. Um, yeah, covered a couple of events, uh, local events here in Perth. Um but yeah, moved on, T time for a diff different chapter. So I've been in the comms uh, game, but kind of kept up film reviews and the uh, PR teams over here, they're, they're really great. So they've kept me on the invite list. So <laughs> I've still been able to see some movies and write up some reviews. Uh, yeah. Fantastic. All right. So today what we're going to do on the podcast is we're going to look back in 2023 and Julian mm -hmm. is going to share with us his top 10 picks for the best movies he thinks uh, that we've had this year. And we'll do a countdown. So I'll uh, say so that I have a top 10 list, but I will let Julian proceed with that. So we'll go from 10 to 1. So Julian, what's your number 10 best movie for the year? Okay, so number 10, uh, look, this one I'm a little bit biased because I love the franchise. It cannot do any wrong for me, but Scream 6, I really enjoyed it. Um, there was a bit of controversy. Nev Campbell didn't come back. They really um, screwed her over with the pay that they offered her and they wouldn't pay her her worth, so they wrote around it. But, you know, I was actually really impressed that um, – what they achieved with the new setting, they've got the new cast, the new um, core team. Um, it was just really scary. It was really brutal. Um, and I was glad that they didn't go to Wood back to Woodsboro. They've done that a few times in the franchise, but I felt this moved it forward a bit. And I felt, I felt like it really was quite scary, you know, um, that concept of, you know, New York, there's millions and millions of people, but, you know, there's still so much that can happen and, no one sees it or no one overhears it or no one cares. No one's looking. They're all kind of in their own little world. So I thought that was a, a really good sequel. Awesome. So my, I actually haven't seen Scream 6 yet. I have to say apologies. So I have to catch up on that. And now that you've booked it in your top 10, I definitely, that's the first movie <laughs> I'm going to go and watch and check it out now. My <laughs> number 10 pick is Anatomy of a Fall. It won the Palm Door at the Cannes Film Festival. Um, it was... A very interesting and unexpected movie. I watched it at the Melbourne mm -hmm. International Film Festival, and I thought the performances were terrific. The cinematography was terrific, and the tension that the movie had. It was mm -hmm. a good, no spoilers here, but the it, it sort of the sexuality of the central character was also, you know, an intriguing element or an intriguing twist about mm -hmm. the movie, which I thought was good. So I quite enjoyed that movie. So yeah, my number 10 would be Anatomy of a Fall. So that's that. I haven't seen that one yet, um, unfortunately. Uh, we will be getting it very soon. Uh, we have a summer film festival here, an outdoor film yes. festival. Um, and I believe they're previewing it uh, tomorrow night. So <laughs> Exciting. I'll be yep. I would be keen to know what you think about that movie once you've watched it. We should probably do another podcast on that one. That's a very cool kind of film. Yeah. <laughs> All right, what's your number nine? Uh, number nine is another horror film. I love horror, so um, but it was a pretty good uh, year for horror. Uh, but When Evil Lurks, uh, an Argentinian horror film, I don't think we got it at the cinema here, but it was on streaming. Um, oh, it just, from the get-go, I was on the edge of my seat. Um, it was different. It was suspenseful. It kind of covered sort of new territory. And just the way that it handled, um, I don't know if anyone hasn't seen it, it's about a, um, a small rural town, or probably not even a town, smaller than a town, uh, just a couple of brothers out on a rural property. Their neighbour comes down with a, a sickness or a disease, but they believe that he's, it's, a, I believe, like a demon that's about to be rebirthed through this neighbour's body. Uh, and just from oh. there, they try to get him off the property and then just everything goes chaotic from there and it's, 
There are some brutal scenes. There are some scenes that just had me absolutely on the edge of my seat. I screamed. I jumped off my couch. <laughs> oh, really? Wow. So yeah. Okay. I so, haven't yeah. seen that one too. <laughs> so what I'm going to do is uh, on the notes on the podcast and on the YouTube, I'm going to put Julian's top 10 movies so you can also try and see where you can view them in Australia. And mm -hmm. yeah, please go and check it out. Yeah, Scream is obviously on, on major streaming platforms, but all the other ones, we'll link it up so anyone who's listening or watching can go ahead and check them out as well. Um, mm -hmm. My number nine is Godzilla Minus One. This is a late entry to my list. I recently, I watched it last week and I was blown away. I mean, the, firstly, Godzilla looks really fantastic in this movie. <laughs> I mean, and the whole, um, you know, post-World War allegory in Japan and, and all of the politics of it, the humanity of it. There's this lovely story of, of a little girl in it. I think it was a very, very well done movie. I thought the visual effects were fantastic. And it's actually a very good blockbuster movie, which I thought, and I hope Marvel watch this and learn something from this. But that's just my two cents to Marvel, not they asking me. But it's a fantastic movie. I, I re it was a good action spectacle, I thought. So Godzilla minus one is my number nine. Number eight. Uh, I'm, I'm looking for, sorry, I just wanted to jump in and say, yeah, I'm really sorry. looking yeah, forward yeah. to it. And it's so funny because just when we're done here, I'm going to go see it myself this afternoon with some friends. <laughs> <laughs> you'll have fun. I can guarantee you, you'll have fun. Yeah. Really looking forward to it. Cool. And what's your number eight? Uh, number eight. Uh, look, I, I'm i going to pick Spider-Man across the Spider-Verse. I'm not hugely keen on animation. Look, I, I, look I, you know, I'll, I'll watch a Pixar movie or whatever. They're always fantastic. I don't always go out of my way to see them. But Spider-Man across the Spider-Verse this year, just fantastic. I Look, I'm going to admit, it's hard. To, it was a little bit hard to follow sometimes because it's another one of those multiverse kind of stories. And we have had a lot of them lately. Um, but this one just knocked it out of the park and just the animation as well. It's yes. it's just stunning to look at. So beautiful. Um, the script, it's so funny. It's so witty. The voice actors, I feel like, you know, a lot of the times these movies, these animation movies, they'll just get the A-list star because of the name value. Yes. They don't actually have like a lot of voice training or voice personality or they just kind of play themselves. But I just felt this one, the cast was amazing. So yeah, an animation one on my list this year. <laughs> and we have a tie, because that's my number eight as well. It is uh, Spider-Man okay. Across the Spider-Verse. <laughs> I love this movie. What do you think about some of the criticism the movie got for that cliffhanger ending? I thought it was great. I think it was fantastic. But I, there was a lot of noise that, oh, it's a cliffhanger. Why would, do we have to wait? I thought it's, that's the whole point of this whole franchise, yeah. right? Yeah. So, no, I totally uh, agree with you. Yeah. <laughs> It was, and the soundtrack was really good as well. And New York looks, and Brooklyn. And, and I like the fact that it had this very um, undercurrent, and it was so complex and dealing with so many different issues mm -hmm. on identity and, and purpose mm -hmm. and role and all the kind of thing. Yeah, so we have a tie on this list. Fantastic. Number eight, mm -hmm. Spider-Man Across <laughs> the Spider-Verse. All right, number seven. Uh, yeah. which I saw way at the start of the year. So I'm a bit rusty on this one, but I do remember just being absolutely stunned and flawed. Um, just such an interesting setting. Uh, you know, she's a, a conductor. I feel like I've never seen a movie about an orchestra conductor before. Um, just an, an unlikable character or very hard to like, you know, very flawed. And Kate Blanchett, she's just fantastic. I... She just blew me away, the whole film. Um, and I must admit, there was, I, I do remember it handling the world so, it seemed authentically to me, like, I haven't, I don't, I've never played an in instrument, I don't know anything about orchestras or how they work and, you know, the politics and all that kind of stuff. And this movie did kind of, the characters would talk about it and it was, it seemed authentic and it didn't, like, dumb it down or or anything like that for the audience, I felt. And half the time, I didn't know what they were talking about because I don't know anything about it, but I actually appreciated that they didn't dumb it down. It was yes. just, <laughs> it was almost documentary-like for me. So, but no, that was that was my number seven. So, I'm, I'm mixed on tar. So, I, <laughs> forgive me, I hated that movie. I just couldn't stand it. 
I, I think the ending when you when it's when it's revealed that she's Lydia Tsar. I was like, I mean, uh, I, I have many issues with that movie, but we won't get into it because otherwise it's, it's, we, we'll be talking all the time. But even <laughs> Blanchett's performance, I thought, was very, very calculated and calibrated. I don't think mm. she was necessarily that good, but it has a massive mm. fan following and critics love it. Critics have gone, like, I remember last year when the Oscars were, oh, sorry, this year when the Oscars were, mm. um, nominations were announced and everyone was like, it's, it, she's got on the bag, she's got on the bag, and critics really rallied behind Tar. So, yeah, I can mm. see the appeal there, but I just couldn't connect with it. Um, my fine. number That's seven, fine. <laughs> thank you, because the people get like, oh, there you go. My number seven is uh, Todd Haynes' May, December. I think it was a very fun movie, but also deeply disturbing. I thought mm -hmm. it was one of those movies where you couldn't make out why these people were doing what they were doing. It was, and that to me was fascinating because it was like, what is real? What is not? What is tabloid sensation? And how much of it is curated? Like. We had these two amazing performers of their generation, uh, Natalie Portman and Julianne Moore, at the giving knockout performances, and it was hard to say what's going on in their mind. And the ending was quite good, but for me, I think the best performance was Charles Melton. I think he was phenomenal as the young dad grappling with, you know, he's sort of stunted. He wants, he's trying to be a good father, a good husband, but he's harboring so much pain and anguish and. And, and guilt also to an extent, and I thought he was great. So Todd Haynes, May, December, definitely number seven. If you haven't watched it, please do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, number six on your list. Uh, num number six for me is the David Fincher film, The Killer. Uh, again, huge David Fincher fan, so he really can't do anything wrong in my eyes. Even Alien 3, I still love it. Yes. It's still so dark, yes. it's still very, much in line with his later work. So, um, but The Killer was just fantastic for me. Um, a Netflix release that, you know, had a small window at the cinema. So I was like, I have to go see it on the big screen. I, did, really I watched it at cinemas as well. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. He shoots for the big screen. Um, look, I, I just love his style. Um, and just the first. I don't know, I guess it was about 20 minutes. I was absolutely hooked because obviously about this assassin, he's kind of camped out in this building across the road from his target. And it's just this inner monologue that's going on and on and on. And I know some people might think it was tedious. I, some, I thought some of it was amusing. But I also thought this is so fascinating. We've seen so many movies where there's assassins waiting, you know, to get their target. And But what do they do? I guess they just sit there thinking. So <laughs> they've got to entertain themselves somehow or keep their mind active. Um, so right from the get-go. But then, yeah, as it progressed, it was just so suspenseful. Um, uh, I loved uh, Michael Fassbender. Um, it was brutal. There was a, a fight scene in it, in a house that just, I, my, draw, my jaw was on the floor. Uh, it just seemed so real, so realistic. I just, yeah, I just loved everything about it. Best cameo performance of the year in that movie. The, min the minute she comes into the movie, and I was like, man, this is, it's like, I was hooked. I have mixed feelings about the killer, but the opening credits, it was classic Fincher taking a piss at everybody. Like, uh, this is me. I know what I'm doing. I'm a stylistic director going out on. I, yeah, I admired it. I don't know if I loved it, but I agree with you. Fassbender, terrific performance. I think he was so, so good in that movie. Uh, my number six is uh, Showing Up. I really enjoyed this movie. I thought Michelle Williams was is consistently, I think, and Hong Cho, I think they give brilliant performances. And it was, it sort of made me think about the relevance of art and the relevance of success. Are we successful only because if, is art successful when someone becomes popular or is art mm -hmm. successful because it's actually a success? I think the fact that it's, it has such low key charm and it uses and celebrates art, but also gives you a little bit of ambivalence about the whole pursuit of art and, and why do we do it and, and why should we continue to do it? I thought it was fantastic. I think uh, a very slow burn movie, but I really, really enjoyed it. It was like a soothing balm, like that kind of vibe it had, you know, it was, it was really good. So showing up was my number six. Number five for you. Uh, number five. May, December. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. You got another one. Yeah, you got it. 
little bit higher on my list than yours, but hey, yeah. I feel like we've got pretty good um, taste. We share very similar taste. Um, but yeah, but all the points that points that you made about May December, uh, yeah, I can imagine some people could be completely frustrated because it doesn't it doesn't allow you to lean which way, like is someone telling the truth or are they not telling the truth? Um, and look, even I was frustrated in parts because I felt like, oh, I just want a little nugget that just helps it solidify it in my mind. Yep. Is Julian more aware? Is she not aware? Um, but the performances were fantastic. And then just the final scene, which I won't give away, but Natalie Portman was amazing and it really did actually encapsulate or it, it actually solidified to me kind of the theme of it and what it was all trying to say in the end anyway. Um, and still, like I said, some people could be completely frustrated. There's no happy ending or, you know, no neatly tied up little bow and, you know, it's all put out on the table and spoon fed. So um, I just loved how just some of the melodrama, <laughs> it's such a heavy, heavy subject, but then yeah. it walks this fine line, which I was just like so fascinated by it. There's some of some parts were so funny. Well, I mean, it's a, it's the satire in there. I feel like there's dark yes, comedy, yes. so it's so interesting. Yeah, I mean, even that hot dog scene. Come on, like you cannot <laughs> laugh your ass off when <laughs> she's not even like that. Was fantastic. Music, what do you? I mean, the music, yes. I mean, that was so so good. It was such a Interesting choice of background music was just fantastic. I thought it was so. What I'd be interested to know your thoughts. So there's, there's a lot of a lot of people are saying it's camp. And Todd Haynes came out in an interview uh, and said that you know he's he's irritated. I don't know if he said irritated, but it's, he he's, he seemed kind of irritated. That's not camp. Thoughts on that? Do you think it's right. camp or do you think it's just a stylistic choice as a director? I my initial reaction was camp. Like <laughs> yeah. Um, which is which it fascinates me even more and maybe kind of why I bumped it up, up the list as far as I did because if that was not the director's intention but that was what came across and it's come across came to a lot of people. It, yeah. 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 So, uh, I mean, I love movies where you can find different meanings that weren't even intended. So, I mean, if it wasn't supposed to be camp, I'm, I would love to know what the thinking process was behind his choices because they seem so they're like a soap opera sometimes like the music just yeah. builds and it's over you know she made yeah like the made the comment about the hot dogs it was so serious and melodramatic and yeah. you think something's gonna happen because they didn't have enough hot dogs <laughs> okay <laughs> Yeah, I I thought it was camp too so I'm surprised that you know that there's this backlash it's not camp but it's, there's nothing wrong with camp. We love camp. What's wrong with it? It's it's completely Absolutely. fine. And yeah, so oh, that's Absolutely. good. All right. So my number five is Ira Sachs Passages. Uh, again, I watched it at the Melbourne International Film Festival. And I have to say that was the horniest screening that I've ever attended. When <laughs> people were just like, it was so steamy, some of the sex scenes in that movie. I was like, my God, what's, what's going on? And everyone around me was like, oh, okay. Um, I, I mean, Ira Sachs was, is obviously a, a, a fine director. And I think this, for me, Fred Slavowski uh, uh, is, uh, if I'm pronouncing his name incorrectly, uh, uh, is, he's just gives such a stunning performance. You know, he's so good. Mm -hmm. And it was interesting to see a movie which is which is not a spoiler now because it's been out for a while and about a gay person who's exploring his bisexuality and and creating all this wreckage oblivious to everyone around him it was quite an interesting take on that and i thought the, there's this heartbreaking scene towards the end between uh, ben winshaw's character and alex's uh, uh the the actress's character and it was just so heartbreaking, like, and, and they realized that they are part of the wreckage and victims of this one man that they both love. I thought it was, um, yeah, it was fantastic. So Passages is my number five. All right. Yeah. Now we're getting into the top four. So what's number four for you? Uh, number four for me is A Good Person, uh, starring Florence Pugh and... Oh, God, I blanked. Morgan Freeman. <laughs> um, oh, she, she's just amazing. It was such a dramatic, such a dramatic, heavy film. Uh, and look, I bawled my eyes out. There was one particular scene. I couldn't keep it together. But she, she's just amazing to watch. And just uh, for a film to have so much 
emotion and I don't know. I don't know what people really think about Zach Braff as a, as a, a film director, you know, coming from Scrubs and then he did Garden State, which I absolutely loved when that came out. I love Garden know, State. I love Garden State. Yeah. I loved it. But I think it's gotten a bit of flack over the years and, you know, in between he's kind of done hits and misses. But I just was so impressed with uh, how much emotion that he captured in the story. Yeah, so heavy. Look, it, it's not... It, it's not a fun movie <laughs> by any any means at all. Very heavy, but I just I don't know. I just had so felt so much emotion, and you yeah. know, it just really left a mark. It kind of the kind of the kind of movie where, if oh, I'd love to watch it again, but also I don't really want to sit through that again. <laughs> it's too <laughs> yeah, much. Sure, okay. <laughs> yeah. All right, I haven't seen that one. I need to I need to check that one out. And Florence Pugh doesn't hit a false note in my eyes, anyway. So I'm oh, sure it's, she's no. she's quite good in that. Yeah. Uh, my number four is uh, Martin Scorsese's Killers of the Flower Moon. Uh, this is Scorsese at his finest. He's, of course, he's a brilliant director. And I, mm -hmm. what I enjoyed was how watchable this movie was. It was entertaining. Yeah. It was informative. Mm -hmm. But it had such terror, horror, and such sadness in it. I mean, the end mm -hmm. credits, complete silence, and then a woman screaming is, is just... I mean, just to mm -hmm. think of that, it's, it's just, this is a, this is a genius, you know? And a lot yeah. of people are saying that, oh, you know, we sh he shouldn't be saying the story and native people. I'm like, I don't have the patience for all of that bullshit. It's like, he is allowed yeah. to say a story. He can say it the way he wants it. And you can't, there, there is valid criticism about Lily Gladstone's character not being fully realized towards the last half of the movie, which is fair criticism, but she's still hypnotic and terrific. Well, she gives a fantastic performance. And I think, mm -hmm. for me, De Niro is phenomenal in this movie. I think he is so, so good. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, Killers of the Flower Moon. I, I love Scorsese. I love everything that he does. So definitely uh, top four for me, number four. Nice. Just missed out on Num my top ten for me. It was pretty high up the list, but just yeah. missed out. <laughs> Why, though? Just curious. Why do you think it missed out? Oh, um, I... Excellent question. I mean, it was tough. It's always tough to narrow it down to 10. Um, True. But, gosh, I did feel like there was a bit too much Leonardo DiCaprio. Um, oh, gosh, I've completely blanked. I'm so bad. Sometimes names just escape me that the the woman who played his wife, and she's getting all kinds of um, yeah, great feedback. Yeah. I just felt if it had a bit more of her character, a bit more of I why agree. she stayed yeah. with him, that kind of stuff. Um, look, yeah, top tier Martin Scorsese for sure. It was it was sensational. Uh, uh, maybe a bit too touch touch too long for me. Uh, maybe a little bit, uh, maybe not repetitive, but just kind of the story dragged a little bit for me. Um, but I mean, gosh, otherwise very moving. Um, uh, an important story. Um, and I went and saw it at the cinema because I thought, here we go, Martin Scorsese, you have to go see this at the cinema. And it was packed. Uh, there were people, all demographics in there. There was like younger guys, older, elderly women, and everyone just sat in dead silence the whole way through. I was like, oh, here, like no one's going to sit through a three-hour movie. Someone's going to get up, go to the bathroom, take out their phone, blah, yeah. blah, blah. Everyone yeah. just sat in total stunned, immersed silence. And I was... I was stunned by that. It was that was incredible. It crossed so many demographics. So it just goes to show you, he's such a fantastic storyteller. Yeah, no, I I hundred percent agree with you. I think the Lily Gladstone mm -hmm. character is not served well in the movie. That that's mm -hmm. genuinely fair criticism, and I and I agree with that. Uh, but also, I have a blind spot for Scorsese. So Scorsese can't do any wrong in my eyes. So that could be one of the reasons it's at number four as well. So I'll admit. <laughs> All right. So okay. number three for you. Number three for me is Saltburn, um, which probably kind of could fall into the camp category as well. Um, that is another, totally camp. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I just thought it was the funniest, wittiest, most uh, perfectly performed. Everyone was on the same page. Everyone was pitch perfect. Even Carrie Mulligan in a, in a like a basically a girl. She's like terrific. Cameo. She's terrific. Yeah. Well, 
what you know I, what the heck was she doing but i loved every second of it and rosamund rosamund pike are you kidding me like she had the best dialogue um and some of the sexiest erotic scenes i mean like a little off-putting they're not <laughs> it's not straightforward stuff but i just sat there and i was like this is this is so erotic. You don't see any eroticism anymore. And it's just gone for it. Um, you know, the bathtub scene, the grave scene, just weird eroticism, but it was there. Yes. It's like, basically, you just don't see this stuff at the cinema. So I I was just on board with it the whole way through. And, um, you know, some people have criticised that it doesn't really say anything or what it is saying about rich versus poor has kind of been there, done that. I thought, Okay, fine, fair point. I mean, um, promising uh, the director's previous film, Promising Young Woman, that kind of laid out what it was saying. That was so obvious. Um, you know, even the Me Too mo moment and all, uh, Me Too movement. Um, but this one, I thought, well, if it's not even saying anything, I don't care. I had so much fun. So I was all over it. <laughs> I actually really like Saltburn, I have to say, and I don't think I've ever been repulsed in a movie, that bathtub scene particularly, and I was I was cringing, but then I couldn't look away, and I'm like, this is pretty, she's, this is exactly what she's trying to say, we're all voyeurs, and, you know, the voyeurism, the, the, the you know, the, that in-between, between disgust and, you know, you know, obsession, mm -hmm. it's like, by God, mm -hmm. and I agree with you, Rosman Pike was fantastic. I thought the oh. cinematography, the production design was brilliant. The music was so oh. good. Um, yeah, I, it was. It really was probably the only movie that repulsed me and entertained me at the same time. And that's a very, very rare thing for a movie to achieve, I think. So, oh, oh good, Saltburn. <laughs> My number three is Past Lives. Um, this movie I love a lot. And someone who's moved countries and... and uh, who sort of grapples with what identity is and what cultural roots are and who we are, what we've become. I thought it was beautiful. I thought it was uh, poetic and uh, the performances were wonderful. Like the opening scene where she breaks the fourth wall, that was just mm -hmm. unexpected oh, yeah. and, and was so wonderful. The ending scene, the last shot, um, mm -hmm. You know that that longing and that fear and that you know and that acceptance uh, is, is, it was it was it was wonderfully done. I think last year the movie that wrecked me was After Sun. I thought I watched that movie and I and I left the theater and I was destroyed. And I think mm -hmm. this year I think Past Lives had the closest impact on me. So my number three would be Past Lives for sure. Yeah. Nice. All right. Top two. What's your number two, Julian? Well, my number two is past lives. <laughs> oh, there you go. So we've got a good list. There you go. So good stuff. <laughs> Very similar. Sorry, um, I feel like I'm preempting all the good stuff that you should be saying because my book had I. Sorry about that. <laughs> all good um look I've, gosh i you nailed it um i mean yeah you kind of encapsulated everything that i felt about it it was just yeah a, one of those films where you know it's kind of it's quiet it's low-key it's about it, it, it didn't feel like anything was exaggerated for dramatic effect it's just people existing and feeling and i, I yeah you you nailed it i i think one of my favorite things about it was her husband's the character's reaction to the whole situation just so supportive and open to it usually these funds of movies would be in a jealous rage and yeah. be like the problematic husband and i just thought this was so beautiful and so such a mature way to look at this whole situation um so yeah I, i'm really keen to watch it again i mean <laughs> It's not like with a good person. It's not, not exactly a fun film, but it's just such yeah. a beautiful film that you just want to sit and go watch it again. Yeah, no, I agree on the husband's character. I think there's a dialogue where he says, I feel like there's a whole world inside you which I don't know or something to that line. Yeah. And it, and he's, and you're so, and you nailed it. And he's, 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 he's just sitting there as a bystander watching it, but there's somehow his performance gives that he also cares that, Yes. Nothing should yeah. flip in her, and it's such a delicate balance. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's a fantastic movie. Uh, mm -hmm. Agree on that one, a hundred percent. So my my number two is Christopher Nolan's Oppenheimer. I I'm a big Nolan fan, and I fucking love this movie. It was compressed 
big screen entertainment. I think when the Trinity test scene came and, and it, I was just blown away, I watched it in IMAX and it looked oh, no. stunning. And the way Nolan captures faces, he did that so well with Dunkirk. But even here, mm -hmm. the he just captures faces. I thought Emily Blunt, I hope she wins an Oscar because I love her. I know people think that it's a small role and she's, I think she's terrific in that. I thought Florence Pugh was very good as well. And all of this criticism about, well, we didn't know about Japan. Well, it's Oppenheimer. He didn't go to Japan. It wasn't about the Trinity test. It was Oppenheimer's story. But everything, exactly. Ludwig Gorsen's music, Heutemann, Heut Heutemann's cinematography, the editing. Robert Downey Jr. was having such a blast in this movie. I thought he was mm -hmm. fine. And mm -hmm. I loved this movie. I loved everything about this movie. And to me, it's... Every is is every all the reasons that I go to watch movies. Oppenheimer gave it to me. Big screen Brilliant. spectacle, Bollywood blockbuster, which is also engaging, and yet has something very cinematic about it, which I loved. So mm -hmm. that would be my number two. Excellent. All right, final call, drum roll. So oh, number no. one no. best movie of the year, Julian. Was it? Do us um, the honors. That's <laughs> all. I that, mean, that would be the most like, controversial pick. You do realize that. That's the most controversial pick. I just, gosh, I mean, God, it was right at the beginning of the year as well. And it's all the way through. I just couldn't stop thinking about it. It was, it blew me away. It was, it was excessive and I loved how excessive it was. It was over the top. It was melodramatic, but it was also... There was just some scene sequences in it that just blew me away. The house party with the elephant and just all the debauchery and the drugs and but then and then it got down to stuff where um what was it the in the the scene in the sequence in the studio where they're starting to film with uh sound for the first time, which I, I think it's going to go down in cinema history. I mean the movie flopped. No hardly anyone went and saw it, but I think that sequence, people have spoken about that sequence and I feel like it just captured so many things about filmmaking that I felt like I'd never seen before. We've seen movies about, you know, the transition from silent to talkies and all that kind of stuff, but they I don't think ever I've ever seen them capture just all the technical difficulties. But also finding humour in it as well, um, and then just, I mean, the guy that just died in that box anyway, sorry, spoilers, if you haven't seen it already, but just like it built and built and the tension and the, the comedy of it and just the difficulties, uh, that just sat in my mind the whole year. I just loved it. I agree with you. I think it, un it got a lot of unfair criticism. Yes, it was ambitious, yeah. bold, and excessive, as you mm -hmm. rightly said, but it wasn't like... It wasn't, I, I'm surprised that the level of backlash the movie got because mm -hmm. it wasn't pretending to be anything else. It was this big, yeah. you know, bombast of, of cinema of a certain period. Mm -hmm. And, and yeah, it was, I, I have to revisit it. But again, it's a very long movie. I, I saw it last year, so I haven't <laughs> seen it since. So I, I have to, uh, but I think I'm, I'm a Damien Chazelle fan. So I think he's, I didn't love it, but I, I didn't think it was that bad that people lost their minds over it. Like it was still, it still has a cult fan, fan following across the globe. People still love it. A lot of people do love Babylon. So, okay. My number one movie is a Hindi movie um, called Rocky or Rani Ki Prem Kahani. If, uh, if you haven't watched it, Julian, it's on Amazon Prime. I would recommend you please watch it. It is sure. movie stars at their finest form. And it's subversive, it's funny, it's tender, and it explores everything from, you know, it, um, what, it, what it means to be loved, what it means to love, what our family is, uh, what it means to fall in love at a certain age, and how those people should be allowed to pursue their love. I think there's so much um, fun in this movie, and it looks amazing, and, and I loved and I'm a sucker for movie stars being movie stars on screen. And when that happens, I'm like bang on there. So for me, I think this movie encapsulated pretty much what movie stars and move, going to movies is all about. So I, I and pretty much like Oppenheimer to an extent, but very different genres. Mm -hmm. Obviously, this is a more romantic comedy kind of movie, but it was the best time I had at the cinemas this year. So if you haven't, please, I urge you to watch it. There you go. I will. All Thanks right. for your recommendation. So we've done a 
No, thank you for recommending so many good movies. I'm going to go and check out all of those ones that I haven't seen and revisit Babylon because now it's made me think after listening to you that I may have missed something in the first time. So I'm going to go back and, and sort of uh, have a look at it again and come up from a fresh perspective because I did enjoy it. I would lie. Yeah. yeah. So there it is, our top 10 movies of the year. So if you, Julian, if people want to find you, how do they find you? How do they read your reviews? Uh, can you please oh, share them? Sure. Yeah, sure. So I have a bit of a blog going. It is Real Review Roundup. Uh, I contribute sometimes to Access Real. Uh, and I mean, I'm on Instagram, so jump ship 83. I mostly post on there as well. Um, but yeah. Probably all of my cool. old old reviews from my old job. That's probably all lost in the internet, but you might get lucky if you find something on there. <laughs> no, so what I'll do is I'll share Julian's current uh, blog on our on the YouTube channel and also on the Spotify channel that we have. So please go check it out. I've read his reviews. He's actually a, one of the finest reviewers we have in Australia. So in my opinion, anyway, so <laughs> do 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 read. No, I genuinely mean. I think I've read I've read few <laughs> reviews. I mean. And the film criticism Australia again is very uh, it's, it's it's a lot niche compared to other countries as you would know. But I think you mm -hmm. you genuinely write very well, so I quite uh, enjoy reading thank from what I'm uh, reading your reviews. So thank you for that. Thank you. So this is the end of it, Julian. Thank you so much for doing this. Now I didn't prepare you, but I'm going to put you on the spot and I ask all my yep. guests one question before we wrap up the episode. What is your oh. anthem song? Sorry, what is my anthem song? My anthem, anthem song. song. Yes. Oh God. Yeah, this is an interesting one. Anthem song. Oh wow. Um. Oh. I hope you can edit this down because it's going to take me a second. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. Anthem take your time. Song. One song that you revisit all, all the time. Oh. Uh, look, you know what? I look. I've got a couple, but the first thing that comes to my mind is the Veronica's Untouched. I feel like that is kind of. I feel like that's kind of become like a bit of an anthem for a generation. It um, has. <laughs> when those violins kick in, just something takes over. It's insane. It is iconic. Um, it's just it's such a bop. Um, and I've seen them live maybe about three times now. They're amazing performers, the Veronicas. Uh, so, yeah, look, ask me tomorrow. It might be a different song, but today, the Veronica's untouched. <laughs> it's a great pick. And the minute it comes to the dance floor, everyone's dancing. So it's you can't exactly. go wrong with that. You yeah. just can't go wrong <laughs> with that. So thank you, Julian. We really appreciate you coming on the Let's Talk Melbourne podcast. And I hope mm -hmm. you come back. And uh, if you're ever in Melbourne, I, oh, I hope you come to the studio and we can do uh, a nice studio chat as well. But um, yeah, I, I enjoyed this. Thank you so much for doing this. And I hope we do more of this again and, and discuss stuff about movies and be fun. Me too. Thank you so much for having me. Have a great Christmas, Julian. Thank you. You too. See ya. Yes.